Welcome to Module 11 of the ADRC Dementia Care Training Series. This is the second of two modules that focus on supporting people with serious mental illness who have developed dementia. This module was made possible through support from the ADRC of Oregon and the Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative. As mentioned in Module 10, serious mental illness refers to people 18 and older and is defined as having, at any time during the past year, a diagnosable mental, behavior, or emotional disorder that causes serious functional impairment that substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities. In this module, we focus on older adults with schizophrenia and cognitive impairment, and older adults who have psychotic symptoms associated with dementia. In this series, we have chosen to focus on schizophrenia and bipolar disorders because these are the two most common and pressing diagnoses. People aging with these conditions often require residential care. To guide the discussion, we will meet three people. Natalia is 66 and lives in an assisted living community. She is increasingly withdrawn from any activity and displays no expression. Natalia almost never initiates any activity. She only eats, gets dressed, or moves from her room when staff come to get her and cue each step. She does not like to be touched, so taking her into a shower can be really tough. Lee is 61 and lives in a licensed behavioral health adult foster care home. He is living with schizophrenia. He has had extended periods of remission of his symptoms throughout most of his adult life. Lately, he has been missing his mental health appointments. He is no longer managing his symptoms well and has had problems at the day program he has attended for years. Physically, he is having a lot of trouble getting around. Jerome is 72 and lives in a memory care community. He is physically very healthy, though he walks with a cane. Recently, he tied his closet doors shut because he said those people were trying to get him at night. During the night, he yells and throws things at the closet door. He is shouting at the caregivers and has taken a particular dislike to the male caregivers. He hit one with his cane. Jerome curses everyone he sees. Yesterday, he knocked a cup of coffee out of the hands of one of the residents because she was looking at him. Our guides for this module will be individuals with considerable professional and personal expertise in supporting individuals who are aging with a serious mental illness, including those who also have dementia. We will return to Natalia, Lee, and Jerome in a moment. First, some information about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a chronic and severe mental disorder that affects how a person thinks, feels, and behaves. A person with schizophrenia may seem like they have lost touch with reality. No single symptom is characteristic of schizophrenia. It is a syndrome composed of multiple, varied, and diverse signs and symptoms. According to the fifth edition of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, or DSM-5, a diagnosis of schizophrenia requires at least two of five signs and symptoms that are present for a significant portion of time during a one-month period. It can be less than one month if the episode is successfully treated. These signs and symptoms include delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, or negative symptoms. At least one symptom must be delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech. We will discuss these symptoms in more detail shortly. These symptoms have a major negative impact on daily functioning, whether at work, in interpersonal relationships, or in self-care. Signs of disturbance remain continuously for at least six months, and other psychiatric disorders are ruled out. Schizophrenia affects about 1% of the population in the United States. Although small in number, the impact on individuals, their families, and communities throughout the life course is high. Based on these statistics, more than 40,000 Oregonians, and between 2,000 and 4,000 older Oregonians, are living with dementia. The average age of first onset is 21 years for men and 27 years for women. Schizophrenia is sometimes diagnosed for the first time in mid or later life. This is exceedingly rare, however, especially in old age. What has been called late onset schizophrenia may be associated with unrelated conditions, such as Lewy body dementia and other dementias. The causes of schizophrenia are unknown, but are thought to be shaped by a combination of genetics and environmental factors. 
These may be coupled with an imbalance in chemical reactions in the brain caused by problems that occur during brain development before birth. The economic burden of schizophrenia is substantial and is estimated at nearly $7 billion annually in the United States. People with schizophrenia have a shorter lifespan than people without the disorder. High mortality rates are associated with lack of treatment, substance abuse, various medical conditions, and suicide. Little is known about the progression of schizophrenia throughout the life course. The experience of older adults with schizophrenia has only recently been a focus of research. Harvey and Davidson highlight the difficulties of conducting such research, especially needed longitudinal studies. Difficulties include recruiting participants, getting representative samples, having appropriate control groups, and people dropping out of the studies. The most recent data indicate that about one-tenth of one percent or fewer older adults over 65 are living with schizophrenia. This smaller number relative to the adult population may be due to a combination of higher rates of mortality, remission, or successful aging experienced by a large segment of the population, or that people with schizophrenia are not known to health and behavioral health systems or to researchers. We do know that in spite of higher mortality rates, people with schizophrenia are living longer. The number of older adults in the United States living with schizophrenia will double between the years 2000 and 2025 to 1.1 million older adults. Currently, the vast majority of older adults with schizophrenia live in community settings. Symptoms of schizophrenia fall into three groups, positive, negative, and cognitive. The terms positive and negative symptoms have very specific meaning when used in the context of schizophrenia. Unlike the way we usually use the term, with schizophrenia, positive refers to a group of behaviors that can be thought of as add-ons to normal behavior. Specifically, positive symptoms with schizophrenia refer to psychotic behaviors. These behaviors are not usually seen in healthy people. People with positive symptoms lose touch with some aspects of reality. Hallucinations are an example of a positive symptom. The most common hallucinations are voices. A person may hear one or more voices that warn the person with schizophrenia about something, or tell the person to do something, or the voice may say mean things. Hallucinations can also be visual or involve other senses, such as feeling or smelling things that are not there. Delusions refer to false beliefs about something. A person with this positive symptom may feel that someone is out to get him or her. Similarly, people experiencing thought disorders have unusual or dysfunctional ways of thinking. It is hard for them to organize their thoughts into something meaningful or coherent to others. Recall from the DSM-5 criteria that at least one of these positive symptoms must be present for a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Positive symptoms persist into old age, though the severity of symptoms vary greatly among individuals throughout the life course. In one longitudinal study described by Cohen and his colleagues, about 25% of older people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia had long-term remission. They lived integrated lives in the community. Another group had persistent levels of disability due to the disorder. Positive symptoms may change with aging. Cohen and his colleagues reported that older adults were more likely to hear encouraging voices and were more likely to obey them than they were to obey destructive voices. These researchers also found that, much like the general population of older adults, older adults with schizophrenia developed many successful coping skills to deal with their persistent symptoms. A second group of signs and symptoms are referred to as negative symptoms. These symptoms do not refer to negative attitudes or behaviors. Instead, negative symptoms can be thought of as abilities, emotions, or behaviors present in healthy individuals that are missing in people with schizophrenia. In the progression of schizophrenia, negative symptoms often appear first, and positive symptoms develop later. Negative symptoms include having a flat affect, that is, not showing emotion through one's facial expression or voice. Similarly, people experiencing negative symptoms have less feeling of pleasure in everyday life. They also have great difficulty beginning or sustaining activities and are often dependent upon others for planning and helping with everyday activities, including activities of daily living. People with negative symptoms may not speak unless spoken to and then may say very little. 
Recent studies indicate that rates of negative symptoms of people with schizophrenia in later life are similar to rates of negative symptoms in younger populations, although it has been widely reported in the past that negative symptoms increase in old age. As with positive symptoms, negative symptoms fluctuate throughout the life course and the severity of symptoms vary from one person to another. Negative symptoms are often difficult to distinguish from depression because symptoms can be quite similar, especially flat affect or lack of pleasure. However, people with schizophrenia have higher rates of depression than the general population. This rate does not seem to vary by age in people with schizophrenia. Those experiencing high levels of positive symptoms are most likely to experience depression. One of the few prospective longitudinal studies of people with schizophrenia that included older adults found that 44% of people with schizophrenia have persistent depression. They may meet criteria for a major depression, which is syndromal depression, or they may have a subsyndromal depression. This means they have many symptoms of depression, but not at the levels of a major depression. About a quarter of the sample in this study fluctuated between depression and non-depression, and about 30% experienced no depression over the study period. It appears that older adults living with schizophrenia, especially those who have experienced severe symptoms, are at higher risk for cognitive decline. However, as with other symptoms, there is considerable variation among individuals. Some studies indicate higher levels of impairment, and others show no difference when compared with the general population. Cohen described a study that followed adults who had schizophrenia and were between ages 40 and 100 years. Over the three-and-a-half-year study, the researchers found that half had no cognitive decline, 40% had slight decline, and 10% experienced very rapid decline. Harvey and Davidson suggest that it is useful to think about older adults as members of two very distinct cohorts. Those now in the oldest age groups were more likely to spend many years in institutions and had long-term exposure to harmful side effects from antipsychotic medications. Those in the younger old age groups experienced fewer long-term hospitalizations, were more likely to have had exposure to recovery service models of treatment, and were more likely to be treated with atypical psychiatric medications. Recovery service models focus on recovery from schizophrenia by helping individuals to develop tools and strategies for coping with symptoms and obtaining supports. Harvey and Davidson found that those who experienced the most rapid decline had a history of institutionalization, severe and persistent symptoms, and low levels of formal education. Schizophrenia is also associated with other health and behavioral health conditions. Even though many older adults with a history of schizophrenia live successfully in the community, and even though treatment has changed for the better, people with schizophrenia still have a shorter life expectancy than those without the disorder. According to studies reviewed by Cohen and his colleagues, and based on multiple measures of physical health and functioning, only about 2% of adults with schizophrenia are found to have positive health and well-being in old age. People with schizophrenia have high rates of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and tobacco use. Metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions that occur together to increase the risk of heart disease, stroke, and diabetes. These include high blood pressure, high blood sugar, excess body fat around the waist, and abnormal cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Elevated rates of these conditions are associated with poor lifestyle factors and side effects from psychotropic medications. Those with persistent or fluctuating symptoms may also have more difficulty accessing health care due to stigma and health disparities. When people with schizophrenia do gain access to care, they are less able to manage their chronic conditions, including taking medications as prescribed. For many years, schizophrenia was viewed as a progressive disease that worsened over time. However, we now know that if people with schizophrenia receive adequate support and treatment early in the disease, the prognosis is often excellent. In addition, the experience of living with schizophrenia at any age can be seen along a continuum. For older adults, this includes successful aging at one end and complete disability due to schizophrenia and co-occurring health and behavioral health conditions at the other. Because the causes of schizophrenia are unknown, treatment of the condition centers on reducing or eliminating symptoms. This includes use of antipsychotic medications, 
Psychosocial treatment helps individuals learn to cope with schizophrenia and pursue life goals at any age. Coordinated specialty care integrates medicine and psychosocial treatment with case management, family involvement, and supported education and employment services. The good news is that with earlier and more comprehensive treatment when symptoms first appear, including use of newer types of medications, people living with schizophrenia can have long periods of remission and maintain full and independent lives. Psychotropic medications are critically important for managing severe symptoms of schizophrenia, especially positive symptoms. These medications make it possible for people with schizophrenia to function and have good quality of life. As Ann Wheeler describes, however, they also are associated with serious adverse effects. The effect of long-term use of psychotropic medications is quite large. Um, we can see um, cognitive decline associated with atypical antipsychotics. We have seen a risk for morbidity and mortality, um, cardiovascular risk factors. We have risk for pneumonia, um, metabolic changes, so weight gain, uh, risk for diabetes, some of those things. So some significant medical comorbidity associated with the use of antipsychotics over the long term. Um, we also see a change in the way the brain uh, reacts to the neurotransmitter changes and the way the receptors change to, in response to those neurotransmitters. So over time, what we end up seeing in a lot of patients is um, pseudoparkinsonism. The atypical antipsychotic medications are those that are newer. Um, so starting in about mm, the 90s, we started to have more atypical antipsychotics. So the newest medications that have been released are considered atypical antipsychotics. Um, they have an effect on serotonin and not just dopamine. So because they have a broader spectrum of activity and a broader, broader spectrum of how they interact with neurotransmitters, we tend to call them atypical. The traditional antipsychotic medications only had an effect on dopamine and dopamine receptors. Let us now return to Natalia. An examination of her medical and psychiatric history reveals that she was diagnosed with schizophrenia when she was 27 and has been on psychotropic medications on and off for decades. Both severe positive and negative symptoms resulted in multiple hospitalizations for psychiatric care throughout her adulthood. Her symptoms were poorly controlled, in part because Natalia would often refuse to take her medications, especially during periods when she drank heavily and used drugs. When she was drinking, she was often homeless. Her family often had no idea where she was, and felt burned out from trying to provide support when they did know. Over time, they lost contact with each other. Natalia never expressed any interest in them. Natalia became very ill because her diabetes was not controlled. Following the most recent hospitalization, she was discharged to an assisted living community. She has now lived there for a few months, and the staff observe that she is increasingly withdrawn. She sits expressionless for hours without speaking. She doesn't want to be touched, but will usually do what she is asked. Her symptoms are consistent with multiple conditions, including depression, dementia, and negative symptoms associated with schizophrenia. Natalia may have all three. How does the staff figure this out? How can they provide support? Understanding schizophrenia as it relates to depression and dementia can help in examining Natalia's symptoms. According to Obelius Desai and his colleagues, People with schizophrenia often experience depression, particularly with age. These researchers report that 40% of older adults with schizophrenia also have depression. The likelihood of depression increases with severity of positive symptoms, poor health, low income, and diminished social support. These risk factors are consistent with Natalia's experience. Although older people with schizophrenia are at a lower risk of suicide than young people with schizophrenia, they are at greater risk than the general older population. Dementia and schizophrenia share many signs and symptoms. As described earlier, cognitive symptoms associated with schizophrenia and those of dementia have commonalities. Both have a similar degree of impairment as measured by the mini mental state examination and both show impaired recognition memory. They also have common risk factors including advanced age and low levels of education. The two disorders are also different in important ways. First, people with schizophrenia who develop Alzheimer's disease will experience a more rapid decline than seen in either schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease alone. 
People with Alzheimer's disease will have a more global deterioration and will do worse on delayed recall. The brain pathology will also be different. The person with Alzheimer's disease will have the plaques and tangles in the brain common to Alzheimer's disease. Let's hear what some of our experts would be thinking about if they were to see someone like Natalia. The long-term um, of schizophrenia and alcohol abuse is not a very nice picture. <laughs> alcohol, um, a lot of people use alcohol to combat their symptoms. They hear voices in their head, they don't always know what it is, and a lot of times it's really mean things they're saying to them. And so they'll drink to get those out, but in, on the other hand, it causes them to have more behavior issues and get evicted from various living situations. So in her case, it doesn't sound like she's drinking right now, but she has in the past. It could make her have a harder um, medical situation. Years of drinking can cause you to lose brain cells and have much more like liver problems and other health problems. The medications themselves also can cause problems long-term. There are risks associated, metabolic risks for these new antipsychotics. And in addition, after a while in schizophrenia, it's known that the brain, um, the ventricles kind of widen and you have some shrinkage of brain material and um, you, you're set up to really have some negative symptoms of schizophrenia and or some dementia. Um, and really, they, you know, you're at risk to have other medical problems. As a member of the care team working with Natalia, one of the things that I would want to know um, regarding her negative symptoms would be, are there changes in environment? Are there changes in her usual care that have occurred around the time that we're seeing more negative symptoms? Have there been changes in her medical status? Have there been changes in her medication profile? Um, all of those things we would want to take into consideration. We would also want to know how well her medications are working to control her positive symptoms. It sounds like they're probably pretty well controlled, um, but at the risk of making those worse, would we really want to make any medication changes at this time? One of the things that we would want to make sure that we assess would be um, depressive symptoms. So it's going to mimic some of the negative symptoms associated with schizophrenia. So is there a new um, depression that we need to evaluate and take care of? The symptoms that are listed as what some people might call depression are probably schizophrenia. A lot of people that with schizophrenia have negative symptoms like staying in their room, isolating, not getting up, not bathing. In the facility where I work, that happens on a daily basis with quite a few people. It's just part of their illness, and you just have to learn to work with it. After a thorough medical and psychiatric examination, Natalia's care team has concluded that her cognitive and negative symptoms are most likely due to her history of poorly controlled symptoms, substance abuse, and homelessness. If this is the case, how can Natalia best be supported? I'd probably want to do a lot of training with the staff in the assisted living facility to learn how to work with her. You're not going to be able to force her to do things, but if she got on a little bit of an antipsychotic, she might be more willing to do things, maybe on a one-on-one -on -one basis instead of in a group. Maybe she could develop a good relationship with one of the caregivers or an activity director where she would interact with them more regularly. Sometimes groups too intimidating for people, especially people hearing voices, because there's so much activity going on in their head, it's harder for them to do anything. If you have schizophrenia, a lot of times you resist um, touch and you resist social connection. And so the usual and customary way to, that you might feel comfortable taking care of um, someone doesn't, it doesn't translate. However, if you have, a, have that awareness, um, you can also get, you can, all, you can still take care of somebody, especially as they age, because the, the positive signs of schizophrenia, the hearing voices, um, the paranoia, um, and the, maybe the aggressive behavior really does subside a bit, or you can manage it a lot better, because a lot of times they are taking medication or receptive to um, getting their needs met. You put food in front of them, they'll eat it, and they don't really ask for a lot. 
Uh, they want to isolate. They don't. They just want to be left alone. So a lot of times you can kind of um, work with them. I think some of the differences are, says are for sure is you always want to to let them know who you are and what your role is and why you're providing the care in very simple terms such as hi I'm Diane I'm the nurse I just want to take your blood pressure give them a couple of minutes to process that information and then go ahead and take their blood pressure again if they're saying no not now that's somebody I'm not going to go ahead and try to force on. I might come back in a few minutes and try it again. A lot of times you'll find that it's it's fine the second or third time you ask. Um, I think also predicting for the patient is very helpful, and this is for any patient, but especially those with um, some mental illness, schizophrenia. It's like, I'm going to come back in 20 minutes with your lunch. Just want you to know I'm bringing lunch. And then come back in 20 minutes, I brought your lunch. It's a lot of prediction, a lot of um, no surprises, because it's hard for um, people with schizophrenia to process information. So the more routine you can give them, the more uh, predictability you can give them, uh, the more secure they'll feel. Let us now move on to Lee. His situation is different from Natalia's, although he also was diagnosed with schizophrenia as a young adult and spent time in and out of a psychiatric hospital in his early 30s. Unlike Natalia, however, he had a strong support system, and his symptoms were managed well throughout his 40s and 50s. He did not misuse alcohol or drugs. He lived with his parents and was able to hold down a job in a supportive work setting. With reminders, he managed his medications well and went to the community mental health clinic for ongoing support. When his parents died, he moved into a behavioral health adult foster care home where he lived successfully for several years, continuing to work and keep his clinic appointments. Recently, the foster care provider and his therapist have grown increasingly concerned about Lee. He is forgetful, and the voices and hallucinations have been increasing. He is missing work, and when he is there, his supervisor reports he is not performing well and his behavior has become erratic. His gait has changed and he has developed some bizarre movements. His therapist informed the provider that Lee is missing more appointments than he is keeping and is not following through on treatment. Lee told the provider that he got lost on the bus going to his appointment. What is happening with Lee? Does he have dementia? Or does his change in behavior reflect the cognitive changes often seen with schizophrenia? In addition to their concern about Lee's cognitive status, Lee's foster care provider is concerned about his movements. She has seen these before. His symptoms suggest that he is developing tardive dyskinesia, one of several drug-induced movement disorders. This disorder occurs with long-term use of antipsychotic medications, particularly the first-generation drugs. Typical symptoms include random movements, especially of the tongue, lips, or jaw, such as chewing movements, tongue darting, or lip pursing. Some people may experience repetitive finger and toe movements, and others may have rocking, jerking, or other movements of the trunk or hips. In addition to long-term use of antipsychotics, risk factors for tardive dyskinesia include older age, being female, substance misuse disorders, and being African or Asian American. No cure for tardive dyskinesia is available, although it can sometimes be managed with drugs. It is vital to monitor people on antipsychotics to prevent the onset of this difficult and uncomfortable condition. This is done by using atypical antipsychotics only as needed, using as low a dose as possible to successfully manage symptoms of schizophrenia and for as short a time as possible. As is evident in Lee's case, diagnosing dementia in a person with schizophrenia is complicated. The assessment tools commonly used to test for dementia have not been validated for this population and are often inconclusive because of the cognitive symptoms associated with schizophrenia. As we saw in Module 9 with intellectual disabilities and in Module 10 with bipolar disorder, the symptoms associated with schizophrenia often mask symptoms of dementia until it is well advanced. Having good baseline information documented by people who know Lee well is critical to arriving at an accurate diagnosis. 
The purpose of any diagnosis is to determine what is happening to Lee and what he needs now. As with any mental illness, and whenever dementia is suspected, it is important to focus on the symptoms and look for underlying causes. By prioritizing symptoms and function, Lee's support team can focus most on how to maintain and improve Lee's quality of life, as suggested by Glenise McKenzie. In practice, when I think when I you know, have uh, someone in front of me who has schizophrenia and is, has cognitive issues, and then the and then um, the that idea about um, doesn't matter if this, the symptoms are related to a, you know, schizophrenia with now just worsening of the cognitive effects of schizophrenia, or is this person you know, an older adult with schizophrenia, and now we're also getting the brain damage associated with an Alzheimer's disease or an actual you know, dementing illness. Um, and I think that there, there's potentially a p good purpose for that, is that you can, um, if you think about giving antipsychotics, you know, giving medications to people with schizophrenia, I'm also blunting a lot of their, I uh, can be blunting their cognition. So if, if it's a, a case of, again, as we get older, we're not processing those meds the same, I'm going to, it might be that if I can back off on the medication, that sort of level of apathy, if it's related to the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, we're not that great about treating them on any age, but maybe I could get those better if I backed off on the medication. So I think it's a, you know, being able to, you know, change some medications might, again, we're trying to look at, is, is, does it matter? It only matters if I can make it, they make their um, quality of life better. It only matters if it changes their ability to function in a day. So I think it is um, really valuable to take that time and thoughtfully look at this person and look at their history and put it together because you know you want the, as interactive as possible to enjoy the day. Um, and then if it is a dementia, I think there's also um, there's there's also re re remembering that if you really have a dementing illness. Some of those interventions that we do for folks with schizophrenia, like um, um, you know, you know, reward systems or you know, behavioral, you know, you know, sort of training kind of things that we sometimes can use or interventions and, and can keep people get people motivated. Um, well, it's not going to work if someone's now got a dementia, right? So you you might have to change um, how you're doing. So I think it is valuable, um, and again, taken in context of what's helping them have a better day. Dementia can significantly affect medication management by those who are unable to remember to take their medications. Um, so it's important to set up um, as streamlined a medication regimen as possible so that they're not having to take multiple doses of multiple drugs each day. So if there's any streamlining that we can do in the do daily dosing as well as the number of medications, that's great. Um, and then using tools such as medication reminders, um, uh, medication pillboxes, things like that that might make it easier for him to take his medication on a routine basis. We might be a candidate for reducing uh, dose. So over time, the um, way the body interacts with medications and the way medications interact with the body, so both the pharmacodynamics and the pharmacokinetics change as patients age. So the way their liver processes medications, the way their kidneys function, all of those things contribute to how much medication a person might need. So we would want to evaluate if it's time for dose reduction. And dose reduction is something that we should always consider before we add additional medications. It's a little bit difficult to tell which is which. Is it schizophrenia? Is it dementia? But when they're hearing voices, it's more of a schizophrenia type thing. We had that one woman who had schizophrenia and dementia and after a while, it was hard to tell which, which we were seeing. And as the dementia progresses, the psych meds aren't going to do a whole lot of good anymore because you're seeing it's very similar to dementia. She heard voices, and she would scream. But as long as you redirected her behavior, she was fine, and you had found out things that she liked to do. So there are ways to do it, but it, it is a little tricky when they have both. There would have to be a lot of uh, collaboration between the psychiatrist and the medical provider in working with someone like that. After careful assessment, Lee's support team concluded that he likely has dementia and that he may have tardive dyskinesia. Changes need to be made to adequately support Lee. This includes evaluating his psychiatric medications to see if they need to be reduced and or changed. Given that Lee is still experiencing positive symptoms when he misses taking his medications, it is very likely that he will need to maintain some level of antipsychotics. The environment will also need to become more supportive, 
taking into account age-related changes such as vision or hearing loss, changes in mobility, and abilities for self-care. At first, Lee's behavioral health adult foster care provider assumed Lee would have to move immediately. However, Lee's case manager was not able to find a placement in an adult foster care home or assisted living community because the staff in those settings were reluctant to care for someone with schizophrenia. After discussion with the case manager and Lee's brother, the foster care provider agreed to help Lee age in place for as long as possible. The people who work in the Behavioral Health Adult Foster Care Home participated in training in dementia care and have viewed the Tier 1 modules of this series. The case manager assured the provider and her staff that it was appropriate and in keeping with their licensure to provide support for activities of daily living, that is, helping Lee with things like mobility, bathing, dressing, and toileting. They learned to increase cueing to maintain continence and help Lee in the shower. With training, they were able to help Lee participate in his preferred activities and redirect him when he seemed confused or frightened. Because the staff had known him for a long time, they could figure out what situations to avoid to reduce behaviors associated with dementia. Over time, staff gained confidence in their ability to help Lee maintain his abilities in a familiar setting. At this time, Lee can still engage in his care and participate in activities that are meaningful to him. Lee's health is stable at this time, and the staff can manage his ADL needs. As his physical care needs increase, however, he may need more care than the foster care staff can provide. Lee's case manager has been working with the older adult behavioral health specialist who has been providing training to nursing home and memory care staff to increase their understanding and reduce their fears about caring for someone like Lee. Now let's turn to Jerome. Recall that he had many behaviors that were frightening for staff and residents. He was increasingly belligerent and talked about people out to get him. He hit a caregiver with his cane and knocked a cup of coffee out of the hand of a resident for no apparent reason. The memory care community wanted him committed to a psychiatric unit because he was a danger to himself and others. The nursing staff thought he might have schizophrenia, and because they were afraid they couldn't handle it, they hoped he would be discharged. We can understand the staff's concerns. Many of his symptoms can be described as psychotic, particularly the delusions and possible hallucinations. If Jerome were to show up in an emergency room, an untrained physician might conclude he had late-onset schizophrenia. When they consulted with the older adult behavioral health specialist, he reminded the staff that Jerome had a diagnosis of dementia and no known history of serious mental illness. He also reminded them that many people with dementia develop psychotic behaviors. So what is going on with Jerome? How can he and the staff be supported? Well, I've been asked to talk or uh, discuss a case about Jerome, who seems to be having some difficulties in his memory care unit. Uh, Not uncommon that uh, uh, these behaviors he's having, which uh, include violence against staff, uh, is not, it's more, it is unusual. Most times, you know, People with dementia, they're not violent. And so that needs to be understood from the get-go. But he's having some problems which are, you know, this, uh, I think they're mainly due to fear. And his world is becoming very, very not understandable to him. People are doing weird stuff. They're asking him to do weird things. They're in his face a lot. And uh, he doesn't know why. And, uh, you know, so often these behaviors, most often I think, are provoked from fear and an element of self-defense. Did he have these experiences in the past of, you know, that provoked this? Maybe, maybe not. So for Jerome, as a member of his care team, some of the things that I would want to know would be um, underlying medical conditions. So is he having issues that might be causing pain? Um, Have there been changes in his environment? Um, Are there, is there an underlying infection? Um, is he having problems with sleep, and is that leading to some of his psychiatric symptoms? And then we would want to also evaluate his mental health and well-being. So are there signs and symptoms of depression that we might need to treat? Um, and then beyond that, we would explore the neuropsychiatric s- symptoms associated with dementia. In Jerome's case, I would, uh, of course, do a medical evaluation first, <laughs> make sure there's nothing medically going on. But I would want more information about him instead of just wanting to kick him out. In, in his case, 
I would rearrange his room so the closet wasn't in a direct eyesight to him. I don't know that yeah, that would work, but it might. And teach the staff to make more calmer approaches to him because it sounded like I had a little bit of a paranoia about people sneaking up on him and when he didn't know they were there, and that would be when he would react. I would also um, talk to the aging services case manager who placed him there and, and request a behavioral consultation with the program they're now able to use because that could be very effective. He sounds like a man that might work better with manipulating his environment than just moving him around. The behavior consultants we've worked with have been very good about getting information and coming up with a plan to help this type of particular behavior. It's been pretty effective. As suggested by our experts, understanding the source of Jerome's distress and the cause of his symptoms is vitally important. This begins by ruling out physical causes, including assessing for pain, constipation, adverse drug effects, sleep disturbance, and delirium. Sensory deficits, including loss of sight or hearing, can affect how people perceive their environment. In addition, understanding who Jerome was before his dementia and what he has done in his life will likely provide clues for his current behaviors. This can help us understand what might be contributing to his fears or his aggressive behaviors toward male caregivers. Examining the environment and how it might be contributing to Jerome's distress will provide another piece to the puzzle. The medical director and the consultants assured the staff that Jerome was not suffering from schizophrenia. The staff wondered if antipsychotic medications could be used to control Jerome's behavior. The evidence tells us that antipsychotic medications are dangerous and inappropriate to use for most older adults, especially for people with dementia. Adverse effects include death, stroke, heart attack and cardiac arrhythmias, falls, diabetes, and drug-induced movement disorders such as Parkinsonism and tardive dyskinesia. Most importantly, psychotropic medications are not appropriate for most people with dementia because they do not address the underlying causes. They should be considered a chemical restraint that can reduce individual well-being and quality of life when used inappropriately. At the same time, Jerome is in a lot of distress and is in danger of losing his housing because other residents and those who support him are at risk for injury. Are there ever times when it is appropriate to use antipsychotic medications for this kind of distress? Antipsychotic medications can continue to be um, an option for the treatment of patients who are in significant distress. Uh, what the American Geriatric Society would say and what I would support would be that this is a last resort. Um, this is a medication, these are medications that we would use if all other non-pharmacologic interventions have failed, if we are sure that the um, uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms are associated with dementia and not due to some other cause, then we would consider the use of an atypical antipsychotic in those patients. If we were going to start an atypical antipsychotic in a person with dementia who is experiencing neuropsychiatric symptoms, we would make sure that we would pick an agent that was going to have um, was not going to have drug interactions that would not have significant impact on their medical and psychiatric well-being. We would start at as low a dose as possible and titrate it up very slowly. And we would want to make sure that we had measurable outcomes so that we would routinely assess how well that medication is doing. And if it's not doing what we intended for it to do, we would discontinue that medication so that we would not be subjecting the patient to other adverse effects, increase in morbidity and mortality risk. Um, so what we would want to make sure is that we continue to evaluate and monitor how well that medication is doing. And sometimes we're going to see partial success, and that's going to be okay. But if we're not seeing any improvement in outcome at all, we are going to want to get rid of those medications. So if we're going to use a psychotropic medication in a patient with dementia experiencing neuropsychiatric symptoms, we're going to want to make sure that we also continue to explore non-pharmacologic alternatives to use in conjunction with a pharmacologic therapy, because that's going to be what's most successful. The companion guide for this module provides more detailed information about specific antipsychotic medications and their appropriate use with people with dementia who exhibit paranoia and delusions, hallucinations, and aggression. Jerome was treated with antipsychotic medication, but the staff also conducted a behavioral assessment to understand the triggers for Jerome's behavior. The behavioral assessment involved all staff who supported Jerome. 
they kept detailed records of when aggressive behaviors occurred, described the behaviors in specific terms, identified what was going on at the time, where it happened, and who was present and what they did. They also recorded how Jerome responded to the staff. After collecting information over several days, his support team, including the direct care workers, met to try to figure out why the behaviors were happening and what the triggers were. They combined this information with Jerome's social and personal history they learned from his family. In the process, they discovered that Jerome had been a victim of violence. He had been beaten badly after being assaulted by a group of young men who had approached him from behind. The staff realized that Jerome did not respond negatively to all male caregivers, just those who were the tallest. One of the caregivers observed that he startled easily and realized that Jerome's hearing was very poor. He would strike out when someone touched him and he hadn't heard them approach. They also learned that the beating had broken Jerome's shoulder, which continued to bother him into old age. They learned that a crowded activity room and dining room caused anxiety. Using this information, the staff made an effort to always approach Jerome calmly from the front and to clearly announce their presence. They made sure he had his pain medications before they assisted him with dressing or taking a shower, and they took care not to extend his arm in a painful way. They also changed his room so that the closet was not in the line of sight and decorated the door so that it did not, not look so much like a door. They learned his favorite music and played and sang along. They reduced his exposure to large groups of people. Over time, several of the staff developed great affection for Jerome, and the antipsychotic medications were discontinued. More information about the use of a monitoring log is presented in the companion guide for this module. In summary, supporting people with schizophrenia and dementia, or people with dementia with psychotic behaviors, takes attention and detective work to understand symptoms and discover the best ways to support the person and contribute to quality of life. Teamwork is critical. When changes in behaviors are observed, it is vital to examine the person's medical, social, and psychiatric history to gain insight into the person. A thorough medical exam is needed to identify underlying conditions that can be treated to improve quality of life. Vision and hearing should be assessed, and if there are deficits, accommodations need to be made. Similarly, attention needs to be given to the environment to explore how the person's surroundings are contributing to behaviors and how it can be adapted to be more supportive. Finally, thorough neurological or psychiatric exams may be needed to determine the source of cognitive dysfunction. Medications need to be reviewed frequently by a physician or pharmacist to determine whether changes need to be made. The review should include an assessment of anticholinergic burden and inappropriate use of benzodiazepines, as described in Module 10. When supporting people who are on antipsychotics or atypical antipsychotics, ask whether the medication can be eliminated or reduced, or whether different medications are more appropriate for the condition of the person right now. As always, support the person and his or her preference to maximize quality of life balanced with safety and care needs. More people living with schizophrenia are entering old age. They are likely to have more medical comorbidities and greater cognitive impairment than their age peers without a mental illness. Aging services providers should not be afraid of the diagnosis. Stigma against mental health conditions has negative consequences for older adults with behavioral health needs and can result in poor quality of life in old age. The vast majority of older adults with schizophrenia do not pose a risk to staff or residents and can be valued members of a community. Aging services providers do need to be knowledgeable about symptoms of schizophrenia and understand how the disorder is treated and managed across the life course. They also need to know that people with schizophrenia can live successfully and symptoms can be managed. At the same time, providers must have a basic understanding of how age-related change and co-occurring conditions affect care and treatment. Help is available through older adult behavioral health specialists located throughout Oregon. Contact information is in the companion guide for this module. As the population they serve ages, behavioral health providers also need to be knowledgeable about age-related changes, including the impact on medication management and the need for increased supports, including ADL support. Behavioral health providers need to be knowledgeable about dementia. 
As dementia progresses, focus needs to shift from a recovery model to dementia support. Mental health providers, especially those in residential care, often can provide ADL support to help people age in place. Contact Aging Services. Help and resources can be found through the ADRC. Meeting the needs of older adults with serious mental illness requires aging services and behavioral health providers to partner with each other and with health providers to understand the source of symptoms and work together to obtain needed resources and supports to enhance function and quality of life. When symptoms appear or change significantly, always advocate for a thorough medical evaluation to rule out medical or environmental causes of the symptoms. Finally, it is important to move from a system focused on eligibility to one that gives priority to maximizing function, regardless of the source of symptoms. So why I think we need to focus on symptoms and function for an individual, and I honestly think this is true for any chronic illness, um, is that the, the purpose of intervening is to um, improve that person's quality of life. And the quality of life is directly linked to function and level of function. And I think about, when I think about function, um, it's, you know, there's the simple one is physical function. I'm thinking, you know, do, is they, do they need a walk or do, so there's physical function, but there's also um, the cognitive function and there's, you know, em, emotional function. And so when I, when I say function, I, that's in the broader term of function. Um, and I want to th- say that, so um, I think it's, you know, that whole idea of figuring out where the symptom comes from what, what's, um, what's making the behavior happen, happen, is it the environment, is it the person, is it a change in something that you know, is going on, um, is the person sick, all those kinds of questions that you ask. But without um, addressing the symptom, I can't improve the function. And for me, it's the function on whatever level of function I'm going for that makes the difference in that person's ability to um, take care of themselves, potentially, um, you know, live as um, autonomously and engaged and happy as possible. Um, so that would be why I think it's important. This concludes Module 11. Please copy this link and complete the short feedback form. This link will also take you to a knowledge quiz that covers both modules 10 and 11. Once you complete the quiz, you will receive a certificate of completion. Thank you again for your attention and your support for people with dementia and their families.